Okay. Well, we're on to uh, some further material tonight. Uh, last week, if you recall, uh, we dealt with the uh, influence of the division of labor on the institution of private ownership of the means of production. And uh, following that, uh, the special case of inheritance, and then the implications for taxation. And we concluded with a discussion of uh, the special case of private ownership of land. Well, we didn't get to the issue of political sovereignty, but uh, we'll just have to let that pass as far as class discussion goes. Tonight, uh, we'll be dealing with uh, the influence of the division of labor on the institutions of economic inequality and also uh, economic competition. All right. Well, let's turn, let's start with uh, the issue of uh, economic inequality under capitalism. Uh, again, a, as usual, there's a, a prevailing view, uh, the view which is uh, stated far more often than not, is uh, along the lines, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Uh, one man's gain is another man's loss. That's the underlying idea. Uh, one man's gain is another man's loss. Uh, if that were true, then it would also follow that uh, to the extent the rich got richer, uh, the poor got poorer, and on a bigger scale. Now, uh, both of these ideas, uh, the notion that one person's gain is another's loss, and the uh, rich uh, get richer at the expense of the poor getting poorer, both of those rest on the underlying assumption that uh, the total production of wealth is a fixed static quantity, that we can only have uh, just such and so much wealth being produced. If that were in fact true, if there was some fixed given limit to uh, production, then it would follow that to whatever extent any one person uh, gained more out of this fixed total, there'd be equivalently less for others. And to whatever extent uh, someone gained uh, substantially, fabulously, as a very wealthy individual would, uh, that uh, there'd be corresponding equivalent impoverishment among the rest of society. And I think uh, this is how uh, many, many people are viewing it, whether they're aware of it or not. Uh, could you think of any other basis for concluding that uh, one man's gain is another's loss, apart from uh, there being just a fixed static overall total of, of wealth produced? What else could possibly explain the uh, belief that uh, one man's gain is another's loss? The laws of conservation that predominated during the uh, Asian Rambo. Excuse me? The laws of conservation which seem to be, which came from the, uh, the sciences, about you know, matter being created and destroyed. Like the law of the conservation uh, of the matter of and energy? Of matter, laws of conservation of energy, laws of Okay. Now, you think that that uh, could be a, a basis? Uh, what would have to happen in order, what would be required if, uh, if the propositions that there's a fixed total amount of matter and energy in the universe as a whole, uh, how would that connect uh, with one individual having more implying that other individuals had less. What portion of the matter and energy of the universe as a whole, or even of the Earth alone, do you think the whole human race uh, presently taps into? Uh, into okay, it's very insignificant, actually. And uh, so long as that fraction can be enlarged, or so long as the utility of whatever we do tap into can be improved, uh, then what's implied about uh, the overall total of wealth that can be produced? See, the, the notion of resorting to the conservation of matter and energy... Wait, uh, was, your was your question, where would the uh, notion of another man's gain is one? Whoever gained there is, somebody else has to lose. Yeah. I, I, exactly where it came from? Yeah. I, I don't think it could come from that, really, any more than I could say 
boy, I'm feeling tired because uh, there's a limitation of energy in the universe. <laughs> you know, it's going from a, a cosmic proposition uh, to an individual on a given day or uh, to the economic activities of the human race. Yes, uh, Ms. Fox. What do you have to do with the fact that based on some of these prevailing views coming from the back of a non-division labor society, the world is slowly becoming a division of labor, but the focused? I think that would be more plausible. Uh, that's, that would be a better observation. Uh, in a non-division of labor society, uh, the ability to produce, while maybe not rigidly static, is uh, is close to static. Uh, just think, uh, if you have a non-division of labor society, uh, what are the possibilities for technological progress and innovation? I mean, there was some. Uh, it, it took a, a million years, perhaps more, uh, for the human race uh, to evolve or develop uh, from the very first human beings uh, to the earliest recorded history. So that represented some kind of progress without division of labor. But look how incredibly slow it was. It took a million years uh, to go uh, from the uh, level of cavemen uh, to very primitive uh, people at the dawn of history. And then uh, over the, the course of history, uh, there were improvements. But again, uh, look at what a, a very miserably slow pace. And when you have uh, improvements at uh, snail's pace, uh, what acts to, uh, that, that we did discuss in this section last week, what acts to offset the gains of whatever progress there may be uh, as far as uh, people are living on the foundation just of their labor? Population. Yeah, population growth, which results in the operation of what uh, further economic principle that we looked at at first early in the term. The law of diminishing exactly, the law of diminishing returns, and along with that, uh, the need to resort to lands and, and mines of inferior uh, quality. So uh, living in that kind of society, uh, where uh, the masses of people never got uh, very much better for very long, uh, it would appear that uh, their standard of living, at least, is uh, pretty much limited. Now, uh, in a division of labor society, uh, we have the framework for a continuing increase in the overall total of what's produced. That was not present uh, in, a, uh, in societies prior to a division of labor. Uh, they might increase the overall total of what's produced, but only at uh, an extremely slow pace. But in a division of labor society, with its uh, multiplication of knowledge, uh, the concentration of geniuses on uh, science and invention and business, uh, the pace of progress is radically increased. And so uh, in a division of labor society, uh, conditions are very, very different. In such a society, it's possible to have uh, continuing uh, substantial increases in the overall total of what's produced. And this, of course, uh, is point two, uh, that uh, the division of labor allows for a constant increase in the total of what's produced. And uh, in such a context, one man's gain uh, resulting from an increase in the total of what's produced is simply not another man's loss. Uh, to the extent that uh, some can gain uh, out of the increase in the total of what's produced, no one else need lose at all. And as we'll see, uh, everyone, in fact, tends to gain. We've already had some indications of that. But uh, let's uh, start with a very simple elementary kind of example that would apply uh, even in a non-division of labor society, though not as a uh, permanent characteristic. And this is the example of uh, Robinson Crusoe and Friday on their desert island. Imagine that we begin, uh, each of them is gathering 10 coconuts a day. And that's uh, basically how they're living. And now assume that one of them uh, devises a better pole or whatever it might be, 
and is able now to uh, gather 20 coconuts a day because he can shake coconuts down from higher up in the trees. All right. Initially, their total combined output was 20. Each had 10, and the, each had 10. And now, uh, one of them, let's say Crusoe, is able to himself produce 20, uh, while Friday continues to produce 10. So here we are. Crusoe has had a gain. Uh, is that Friday's loss? Obviously not. Now, as a matter of fact, as this example itself uh, can illustrate. Uh, there is a basis uh, for the gain of the one uh, easily leading to the gain of the other. If Friday's gain, if Crusoe's gain rather, rests on uh, some improvement in methods of production, such as now using a pole to uh, shake the coconuts down, uh, Friday can copy that method. And then uh, Friday too uh, could gather 20 coconuts a day. And maybe then uh, Crusoe is on to some further innovation. So this is point three, how the gain of the one easily leads to the gain of the other uh, productive emulation. Now before we leave this uh, primitive example, uh, it can illustrate uh, another significant point, and that is the fallacy of unjust distribution. Uh, there is a horde of people who never stop complaining about the injustice of the unequal distribution of uh, wealth and income. Now, uh, here on this uh, desert island of Crusoe and Friday, uh, you could uh, compile statistics of a, quote, distribution of wealth or income. Uh, here we are. Initially, the uh, total income is 20 coconuts. Uh, Crusoe is getting half, and Friday is getting half. Then, uh, after Crusoe makes his improvement, uh, the total income is 30. Crusoe is getting 20, and Friday is getting 10. Now, uh, the critics of unjust distribution uh, could look at the second case and say, well, look, there are only two people on this desert island. Why is uh, one, one half of the population getting two-thirds of the income? This is some kind of unjust distribution. Well, let's look at this for a moment. Is there, in fact, any actual physical distribution of the, of the product? Is there a distribution fairy who lands on the island with a big basket of coconuts and says, okay, here, uh, Friday, here's just 10 for you. You haven't been too good a boy this year. But uh, for Crusoe, there's 20. And maybe uh, Friday has been just as good as Crusoe. Now, does Friday have a basis uh, for complaining about an unjust distribution of income? Is there, in reality, a distribution of income? What is there in reality? Production. There's a separate production of the two individuals. One is producing 20, the other is producing 10. Uh, mathematically, you can state uh, the 20 as two-thirds of the total of 30, but is this a literal physical distribution or just uh, like a metaphor uh, for uh, a, a mathematical statement? There is no actual distribution. and. Uh, if it were unjust that half the population is getting two-thirds of the income, uh, since the foundation is that the half is producing twice as much as the other half, uh, is it unjust for some people to produce more than others? Is that unjust? No, no that's ridiculous. Well, there is no uh, distribution, and the inequality, uh, certainly in th this kind of situation, results from uh, an unequal uh, amount of production. And I say the fallacy of unjust distribution when what is actually involved is an inequality of production. Now, uh, to turn now to the conditions of a division of labor society, in such a society, uh, one man's gain is, uh, typically implies the gain of others. It's not merely that one man's gain is not another man's loss. That's true. But it's more than that. One man's gain uh, in a division of labor society is typically the gain of others. And this will be especially true in the uh, in important cases of people making major gains, uh, accumulating great business fortunes. Now let's see uh, what is the basis 
for uh, one party's gain being the gain of others, not merely not their loss. Well, there's first this phenomenon that we uh, saw a moment ago in the case of Crusoe and Friday, uh, productive emulation, where Friday sees an innovation of Crusoe and then he applies it himself. Well, that's uh, what's involved in economic competition. Uh, some uh, firms introduce innovations, and then as soon as possible, others uh, come out with their version of the same improvement. And uh, so this means the uh, we have this productive emulation, uh, the productivity, uh, the improvement in productivity is extended, it's widened. So that's uh, one significant factor. And then uh, we have others. Uh, there's the nature of free exchange, the nature of free exchange. Well, what's involved in every free exchange, every voluntary exchange? Why do the parties enter into a <coughs> voluntary free exchange? They will, they will both benefit. Each party values that which he receives more than that which he gives up. That's the only reason that people uh, enter into the exchanges voluntarily. But then uh, there is a wider issue and this is uh, what I refer to under the uh, heading, the sharing of the growing gains from the division of labor. Uh, this uh, aspect of uh, productive emulation and competition is certainly one very important feature, but there's more involved. Uh, just think of the implications of the multiplication of knowledge. The fact that in a division of labor society, the, each participant gains from the total volume of knowledge employed in production in the entire society. Each of us uh, knows his own job, that's what we spend our working time on, but what do we obtain in our capacity as consumers? What bodies of knowledge are we benefiting from in our capacity as consumers, as buyers of the products? Continued uh, innovations? That's true too, but we're getting the benefit of the entire range of knowledge employed by all the participants who produce the things we buy. So uh, whatever the uh, number of specialized bodies of knowledge, just think how many of them are entering into the production of this or that particular product that you buy. When you buy an automobile, what would be some of the specialized bodies of knowledge that you'd be getting the benefit of? Pardon me? Engineering. Uh, engineering. Uh, all of the specialized bodies of knowledge of all the different occupations, the different job descriptions uh, in an automobile plant. And standing behind that, the different job descriptions in the steel mill that produce the steel that is used to make the automobile. And everything else involved. Now, uh, you and I uh, know our own particular job. Uh, we could learn some others, no doubt. But uh, just think of the many hundreds and thousands of distinct jobs that enter into uh, the production of all that we buy, and that's what we're all getting the benefit of. And to whatever extent that uh, process widens and we get uh, more uh, bodies of knowledge into the picture, uh, we're getting the benefit of that much more overall knowledge. And then there's the dynamic aspect that uh, in a division of labor society, uh, a significant proportion of the most intelligent, most ambitious members will be concentrating on what sorts of work? What will a large proportion of the most intelligent, most ambitious members of the economy be doing? What kinds of occupations will they have that you would not find on any scale in a non-division of labor society? Innovators, technology. Okay, they'll be concentrating on science, invention, and business, which is centering heavily on innovation. So uh, what is the effect of that on the body of knowledge that enters into the productive process from generation to generation? It increases. So uh, what should that do to the overall total supply of goods produced? Increase. It will increase it. Uh, this is perhaps uh, the most important uh, aspect of uh, the gains of uh, the one or some uh, tending to be the gains of all. 
those uh, who introduce the uh, newer, better products, the more efficient methods of production, they will certainly gain, but uh, so too will practically everybody else in the society. Yes, uh, Mr. Tse. Um, so do you see the, the protection of intellectual property as a ingress of competition, or do you see that as a competitive advantage of Protection of intellectual property? Yeah, it's uh, an advantage to the inventor. All right, is the protection of intellectual property uh, uh, a stimulus to advance or a hindrance? Was that uh, your question? All right, that's a very good question. Are things like patents, copyrights, uh, trademarks, brand names, uh, are they uh, uh, a cause of uh, greater progress or, or a hindrance? Well, I would say uh, that will depend uh, in large measure on their term. Now, the basic uh, rationale uh, for patents and copyrights is uh, to give uh, inventors and, and authors the benefit of their intellectual creations uh, by recognizing uh, a moral right on their part to benefit from their creations and giving it legal protection. And I think uh, that premise is true up to a point. Uh, if it's for a reasonable term, uh, you want to have at least sufficient protection so that it's very worthwhile for people who can succeed in coming up with any significant uh, new method of production or new product uh, to benefit from doing so, because uh, then uh, they'll certainly be more motivated to do it. If they couldn't benefit, we wouldn't have very much progress. Uh, but it is possible that uh, if the uh, protection is unduly protracted, then it could serve as a hindrance. Obviously, if we had had uh, a patent on the wheel and it were still under protection, uh, that would not do any of us any good. So what you want is some reasonable term uh, for these things. And I think uh, the system that we, we had, at least until fairly recently, uh, probably satisfied that. Uh, 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 the term of a patent on an invention, I believe, was and probably still is uh, 17 years, is that right? And then it might be renewed one time. Well, that's probably in, in the right ballpark. You could argue for a little more, a little less. And uh, the copyrights on uh, books and so forth uh, had been, I think, uh, 28 years with one renewal to make a total of 56 years uh, until uh, the uh, copyright on Mickey Mouse was threatening to expire. And then uh, uh, Michael Eisner managed to arrange legislation extending the copyrights for, for many more years. See, he couldn't come up with new characters uh, as uh, Walt Disney could, but uh, his contribution was to uh, extend the, the term of copyrights. That, I think, is highly counterproductive. There, it's, it's a hindrance. So it's an issue uh, of duration. Now, uh, trademarks, brand names, uh, they can remain forever. Uh, it's not stopping anyone from doing anything of any significance. So I hope that's uh, an answer. If anyone is uh, interested in reading a further discussion of this, there's an essay that I recommend very strongly uh, called Patents and Copyrights, and it's by uh, Ayn Rand in a uh, book widely available in paperback called uh, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. And that, I think, lays out a, a very good philosophical foundation for the existence of patents and copyrights and also uh, uh, indicates uh, the reasonable terms uh, for their uh, duration. Now, uh, let me turn uh, to what I consider the very especially important case of the origin and disposition of fortunes as illustrating the point that one man's gain uh, is the gain of other men, not just not their loss, but uh, the positive gain of uh, just about the entire rest of the society. And we're focusing now on uh, the accumulation of uh, business fortunes, and I'm gonna to try to show that uh, both in the foundation of how they're accumulated and also what is done with them as they're accumulated and after they've been accumulated, uh, there is a, a major benefit, uh, by no means just to the accumulator, but to uh, the society at large. And let's start with uh, 
simply the financial arithmetic required in uh, building a great fortune. And I, I may have touched on this uh, in the past, but uh, if so, I, I'm sure it could stand a repetition. Uh, suppose someone uh, starts out with uh, some modest capital, in today's context, perhaps 100,000 a year, 100,000 dollars would be a, a modest capital. And uh, the objective is uh, to grow it to something very substantial, let's say a billion dollars. Now that's, uh, I think, 10,000 times uh, larger. Uh, a billion is uh, 10,000, 100 thousands. So you'd have to be increasing your capital by a factor of uh, 10,000. Now, uh, you could do this over a certain period of years, let's say uh, 20 years, uh, but in order to do so, uh, some definite compound annual rate of growth is, is implied. I don't know precisely offhand what that growth would be. It would be uh, some substantial rate uh, if you were able to uh, grow at 100% uh, a year, uh, that would, I'm sure, easily do it. Uh, probably uh, in, in uh, two to the fifth is an increase of uh, 32. Uh, uh, two to the fifth uh, twice, uh, two to the tenth uh, is an increase of uh, 960 something. And uh, uh, in 15 years, uh, it would come out, I guess, to uh, roughly 30,000 times. That would be three times more than we need. So uh, the annual rate of accumulation uh, would be less than 100% if you were uh, doing this over 20 years. But uh, the point is you need some kind of very high compound rate of growth. You start with 100,000 and then not too much lo uh, later you have 200,000, then the 200,000 is 400,000, on and on. You keep doubling and redoubling your initial sum and it's not all that long before it could become a billion dollars. Uh, if you stop to do the arithmetic, if you were offered a job uh, where your salary would double every day, uh, it would be worthwhile starting at a penny a day and working for a month. Uh, you'd then be up into the millions uh, by the end of the month. So uh, that just illustrates how rapidly uh, that higher rate of growth uh, will increase. Now. Uh, so the, the key is a high compound rate of growth. Well, what do you need to be able to do that? What kind of uh, rate of return do you need? Large. You need a rate of return that is at least that great. Uh, it has to be greater uh, to whatever extent you're consuming out of the rate of return. Imagine uh, you are earning a uh, 100% annual uh, rate of return. Well, uh, your 100% annual rate of return would not mean 100% compound annual growth unless you were saving and reinvesting the entirety of the return. Uh, if you were consuming, if you had 100% rate of return and were consuming it all, uh, you wouldn't be growing at all. Uh, the ability uh, to grow your capital depends on a combination of two things. One is you have to earn a very high rate of return, and then what do you have to do, at least with a far greater part of that high, high rate of return? Yes? Not consuming. You have to abstain from consuming it. You have to save and productively expend it to expand your level of operation. You have to earn a high rate of return, uh, save and reinvest uh, the far greater part of the profit so that the next year you can uh, operate on an expanded scale and earn that high rate of return on a bigger capital than the year before. It's those two things together that are required. Well, what have we seen uh, you typically need to do in order to earn a high rate of return over a protracted period of time, given that uh, as soon as it's realized that you are earning a high rate of return, competitors will be attempting to uh, duplicate what you're doing and will start to succeed. Yeah, I have to introduce further uh, improvements. Uh, the basis of your initial high rate of return is uh, one improvement. 
uh, that will give you a high rate of return for a time, but not forever. And uh, once competition uh, starts chiseling away at that rate of return, well, where have we seen uh, all rates of return are tending? We had a lot of discussion of the uniformity of profit principle. Uh, where uh, do the high rates of return uh, tend to go as the result of, of competition for they others? They go down until they start to equalize. They, they tend to go down toward the uh, general going rate uh, as the result of competition. And uh, if you want to maintain a high rate of return uh, in the face of others' competition, what will you have to do? You'll have to have further innovations. So in order to earn a high rate of return over a long period of time, unless, of course, uh, you're able to get the laws changed on uh, innovations and uh, enable you to profit indefinitely uh, from uh, one set of innovations, uh, in a uh, free economy, uh, you'll have to have further innovations. Well, uh, let's examine this or review it a little more closely. Uh, we've already d had discussion of this, uh, in essence. Uh, when the uh, innovation is introduced, whether it's a newer, better product or a more efficient method of producing an existing product, uh, once the, the rate of profit on that innovation is uh, brought down to the general level, at that point, uh, who are the exclusive beneficiaries of the innovation? Consumers? It's the consumers. The, and how is it the consumers, uh, uh, Mr. F uh, Feldman? The better technologies at the lower cost. They're getting a better technology uh, if the uh, cost of production and uh, has been cut and the uh, product also improved. Then they're getting uh, better products at lower cost. Uh, if only the product is improved, well, then they're getting a better product at the same cost, uh, or if uh, the product is unchanged but the cost is cut, well, they're getting it at a lower cost. So uh, the ultimate beneficiaries of these improvements are the consumers. And then uh, the process is repeated over and over and over again, uh, indefinitely. So what's happening to the benefits in the hands of the consumers? They're continuing to increase. And we can see this, uh, the record of the last 200 years is a progressive rise in the average standard of living uh, throughout uh, all of the advanced countries of the world. So uh, this pertains to the origin of a great fortune. The origin is in a high rate of profit earned over a substantial period of time, which uh, almost certainly requires uh, the introduction of a series of significant improvements in products and or methods of production. That's the way a fortune uh, originates on the basis of a series of uh, significant innovations uh, in quality of product and or uh, efficiency of producing it. Uh, so this all comes under the heading the origin of the fortunes. But what is done with the fortune? Where does the fortune reside as it's being accumulated and after it's been accumulated? Invested. It's invested, and what does that signify? It's invested in a, a growing quantity of improving methods of improving means of production. An invested fortune means uh, you've got a growing volume of means of production. Like Walmart started, I assume, with one little store. Uh, they made good profits with it. Uh, they saved and reinvested. Then they had two stores, uh, made good profits with that, saved and reinvested on a bigger scale, and now uh, they're the biggest retailer in, in the world, probably. And uh, the old Ford Motor Company uh, started uh, back in 1903, with a capital of about $25,000, uh, producing a handful of automobiles in a year, a very primitive rickety contraptions by primitive methods of production, uh, but they were doing it better than uh, almost anybody else. And they made good profits. Uh, they expanded. They had uh, further improvements along the way. And uh, by the time uh, old Henry Ford died in 1946, 43 years later, uh, he had a fortune of a billion dollars. Well, where was his billion? In all of the assets of the Ford Motor Company. 
So uh, the Ford Motor Company started with a little barn or some equivalent uh, when they had 25,000 of capital. And uh, by the time of Ford's death, out of the reinvested high rates of profit uh, made on a foundation of such uh, major improvements as the moving assembly line, uh, interchangeable mass-produced parts, and, and many, many other things, uh, they ended with a billion. Now notice uh, the billion was earned uh, by a process of substantial improvements, repeated improvements. And uh, as the fortune was being earned and went after it was all fully accumulated, uh, it resided in uh, the massive means uh, of production uh, that the assets of the Ford Motor Company represented. So here we are, Ford makes a billion. And what is the effect of his making a billion and then the use of his billion on the rest of the society? <coughs> Yeah, the average person is getting the uh, ability to uh, afford to buy a new automobile that is uh, vastly improved compared to what had existed before. And the billion is invested in the means of producing such automobiles. So Ford gets a billion. Uh, his personal realized uh, benefit uh, is he certainly has a much higher standard of living than the average person. But meanwhile, the average person is getting the ability to have an automobile, and uh, Ford's billion is invested in the means of producing those automobiles. Well, to me, this seems like one man's gain uh, being the gain of just about everybody else. Now, there are many people uh, who, at least by implication, uh, seem to say that uh, uh, Ford is, is a robber uh, when we began uh, other people owned the auto factories. Ford stole them. Uh, he didn't do anything uh, to improve the standard of living. Uh, he just made the rest of the society poorer by a billion dollars. Well, I think that's uh, utter nonsense. I would say uh, the paradigm in this uh, Ford case, uh, that's uh, what applies uh, to uh, every fortune earned uh, in a free market. This would not apply to fortunes earned on the basis of government subsidies or government policies uh, harming your competitors. But uh, if you can make your fortune uh, in free competition, uh, this is the paradigm. So the people who are making fortunes are the people who are improving uh, the products and methods of production for uh, the average person and whose uh, wealth is then used in producing such products. Yes, Mr. Levy. Just to kind of follow this through, this idea I was reading about what they call the rubber barons. Rubber barons, yeah. <laughs> which uh, you know, they, they were operating with the free market. They basically created uh, a, a tremendous supply and, and a tremendous amount of capital influx into the north of Brazil. But in this argument, how do you justify the means of? in this case, unfair exploitation of labor in order to supply that market. All right, now, you're saying uh, the producers of rubber uh, were getting their raw material, I guess, from rubber trees in Brazil, mm -hmm. and also the rubber trees in, in Malaya. Yeah, I guess it, oh, it doesn't even need to do I think it's just a question of the slavery concept, right? Of how, in a, in a capitalist open market, yeah. is there a conflict you know, just following the, the concept through that, that the development of wealth has a trickle-down effect to everybody's gain. Okay. To trace it back to the concept of, okay, the initial generation of that wealth might have certain inhumane origins. Okay, you're saying, uh, here we are, uh, the people are making a lot of money in rubber. Uh, they're employing uh, people at very, very low wage rates in places like Brazil and Malaya. And you think that because those workers are paid low wages, that is proof that they're exploited. Well, that's not my argument. Uh, I'm just okay. trying to trace the... Okay. Well, certainly this is what many people say. Okay. All right. Now, uh, if it were the case that uh, employing these people is exploiting them, uh, what would be the effect if uh, the exploiters just weren't there? They had never come or they packed up and left? How would that affect the uh, people who are working for them at uh, miserably low wages? then they wouldn't have any wages at all or lower wages still. 
you see, it's not an exploitation. The fact that you're able to employ someone at a very low wage, that does not mean that you're exploiting him. That would presuppose that you had some kind of duty to him uh, to pay him uh, some uh, minimum level of wage. But when uh, people come in and are employing labor, what is the effect of their appearance in the market on the demand for labor in that market? It's increasing it. So while the wages are, may still be miserably low, they are not as miserably low as they otherwise would have been. They're now somewhat better. And uh, it is not slavery unless you had the ability to go out and round people up and put them in chains and drag them to work. That would be slavery. But do you think that's what got the people to work uh, in, on these plantations or uh, in, in the factories or wherever? Uh, do you think that uh, uh, there were gangs going out uh, of, of slavers? Well, in the case of Brazil, there were. Pardon me? In the case of Brazil, there were. In the case they did take the natives and enslaved. Well, now, there was slavery in Brazil at one time, but I think it ended uh, sometime in the 1870s, and the... Uh, the rubber industry did not begin until some time after that. So the fact that there was once slavery in Brazil did not this mean... This was an African slavery, this is indigenous. Yeah, it, slavery within Brazil. And in Brazil, uh, slavery ended not all that much longer after than our own slavery. I think sometime in the 1870s or maybe 1880. In any case, before the, uh, the tire industry. But now, if you're asking, uh, suppose there were uh, some kind of... Uh, business involvement in conditions in which there really was slavery, uh, then uh, th there would be something wrong with that. That would be, that would be true. Now, you might find uh, such a case today, uh, possibly uh, on the part of some firms uh, investing in China, but I don't know. I don't know which firms or if that's in fact true. I've heard that stated. Well, that would be, that would be a serious problem. But just so I, if I understand correctly, so long as there's a wage mechanism the system is in place to ultimately trickle down to Okay, now you say the trickle down. Uh, I'm glad, thank you for repeating that. Uh, the, the basic fact is, uh, if there's investment that raises the demand for labor, raises wages, and uh, we've seen how the whole process develops. Now there are people uh, who disparage this by saying trickle down. Because here we are, we're saying, uh, the masses, of, the standard of living of the masses uh, depends on the actions of a relatively small minority of productive innovators. Uh, the people uh, who are introducing the new and improved products, who are saving and reinvesting heavily, these are uh, a relatively small number of people who are revolutionizing the products and methods of production and raising the whole society. <coughs> and the critics of this say, well, this is trickle down. Well, this isn't trickle down. Uh, this is the way uh, the process works. Uh, the improvement in the general standard of living depends on innovation and saving and investment. That's what it requires. And it's not a little trickle. Uh, it's, it produces a very uh, substantial, noticeable rate of progress so that within a single lifetime, uh, economic conditions are radically different than when you started. Uh, my father, for example, grew up in a world where there were no automobiles, no telephones, uh, nothing of this kind. And uh, when he died, we had uh, most of these things well established. Uh, you and I, I think, uh, began in a world uh, without cell phones. Uh, maybe uh, you're not old enough to remember a world without computers, uh, but I do. Uh, without uh, home freezers, uh, without jet airplanes, uh, without uh, without uh, all kinds of uh, modern drugs, antibiotics, uh, uh, lasers. Uh, so th there's lots of things that uh, have come along uh, fairly recently. Uh, we have uh, rapid progress, and uh, th this is not trickle down. It's very dramatic, well, and would be Reagan, more dramatic. Reagan's yeah. use of trickle down to have the same sort of negative connotation. Excuse me. Reagan's use of trickle down because that's what I reference when I use it is his concept of kind of that everybody's game. Yeah, but he said, I never uh, heard uh, President Reagan use the expression trickle down. The critics of Reagan would use that expression and then uh, say that's uh, his philosophy. They attribute to, uh, it's a common error uh, for people to attribute uh, their characterizations 
uh, to the philosophy espoused by someone else as though he were espousing it that way. As though he would say, well, I'm uh, advocating the trickle-down theory. So inherently it's a negative critique. It's, uh, it's an, an aspersion. Yeah, it's, uh, pardon me? I think George Bush on his elections made statements that trickle-down economics work. Well, he might have. That's that's possible. Supply side economics has been used. That when Reagan referred to it as supply side economics, with and the effect was a trickle down effect. Yeah, but I think he used to make that statement. George Bush did. You say you heard Reagan, or you know, you saw a quotation where Reagan appeared to endorse the expression. Supply side economics that he was promoting. This is when I was in college. And he said that. You see, again, I would think uh, the authors describing the trickle down, him. The trickle-down effect of supply-side economics. And it, was, it was in his, uh, it was in my college newspaper. And it wasn't a liberal college. I, but it was, I would assume that that's the author's characterization. Okay. I'd be very surprised. I can't stake my life that Reagan would never have said that, but uh, I would be very doubtful. Now, uh, that's a, a term of disparagement. But if you investigate this uh, more closely, uh, what is the alternative theory? If, if the way the standard of living rises is not on the foundation of, uh, of, it, of innovation and saving and investment, uh, then how does it rise? Uh, what, what is the theory of the critics, of those who are complaining about trickle-down, who aren't satisfied with trickle-down, by which they mean uh, the process of saving and investment and innovation, uh, that that isn't enough for them. Uh, what do they want to do? What do they What do they offer instead? Socialization. Yeah, their idea is uh, we're not interested in all this slow academic, uh, rationalistic nonsense. Go out and grab the goddamn stuff. That's <laughs> now I characterize that as the loot and plunder theory. See, uh, they call. Uh, uh, sound economic theory. Uh, their term is trickle down, uh, which is an unjust description. It's minimizing the process, disparaging it. I think uh, with far greater accuracy, their theory can be described as the loot and plunder theory. If you're not satisfied uh, with private property and capital accumulation, and you think that's too slow, and uh, you want to be elected uh, uh, to put your program in force, well, uh, how are you going to do that? Uh, you have to send goons to seize the wealth. Okay. Now, uh, let me uh, spend a little uh, bit of time on the uh, Marxian doctrine on economic inequality uh, to provide a critique of it. Uh, from the perspective of the Marxists and those who are influenced by Marxism, uh, economic inequality under capitalism is a mere continuation of economic inequality uh, that existed under earlier uh, forms of social organization. Uh, in the uh, uh, Communist Manifesto, uh, there's a passage to the effect uh, that all of human history is the record of one continuous class struggle that has been carried on under different forms and guises in different historical periods. And they say, in the ancient world, it was between uh, master and slave. In the Middle Ages, between lord and serf. And in modern times, uh, between capitalist and worker. And they think that uh, the relation between a capitalist and wage earner is essentially a mere continuation uh, under a different uh, outward superficial form of the relation between a master and a slave, or a lord and a serf. And that uh, surfaces in such contentions as uh, the origin of fortunes is slavery. Uh, that's uh, how the Marxists are thinking of uh, the wage earner in general as uh, being a slave. You've heard the expression wage slave. Well, that uh, comes from Marxism. Now, uh, I think it's very, very important to realize that uh, there is no legitimate basis for classifying uh, businessmen and capitalists under the heading of, uh, under the same grouping as uh, uh, feudal aristocrats 
and, uh, and slave owners, as the Marxists do. Uh, there's a radical difference. And the difference is, uh, right here, uh, productive contribution and general benefit, that's what the uh, businessmen and capitalists are providing, they're earning uh, their fortunes on the basis of productive contribution. That's what we've established in connection with the requirements of earning a premium rate of profit, especially over a long period of time. And uh, in saving and reinvesting the profits, everybody is benefiting through being able to buy the products and uh, through a greater demand for the labor they sell. It goes back to the discussion of last week. So uh, the economic inequality under capitalism is based on positive productive contribution accompanied by a general benefit to the rest of society. Well, uh, under feudalism and slavery, uh, the essential characteristics were the opposite. So you just think, what is it that enables a slave owner or feudal aristocrat uh, to have a higher standard of living than other people? Is he a great productive innovator, a heavy saver and investor? Pardon me? He owns the land to keep it. I mean, now you say uh, he owns the land. Uh, that's a, that's a common answer. Pardon me? In the feudal sense, he can't sell it. I, uh, in reality, uh, the feudal aristocrats were not landowners, but that's a point that needs special discussion. Uh, what would keep the serfs uh, on the land and uh, uh, keep them there uh, continuing uh, to suffer exploitation? Why don't they just leave? It was against the law to leave. Uh, the feudal aristocrats uh, had the power, uh, in some cases, to hang uh, people for offenses, in virtually all cases, at least to flog them. So what was the basis of their higher incomes? A physical force. Uh, they were engaged in a process of systematic robbery. And the same is true of a slave owner. A slave owner uh, it's like uh, being with a stick-up man uh, 24 hours a day. It's one thing to be robbed. Uh, you turn over your wallet or whatever. But imagine that uh, the robber is with you uh, 24 hours a day. And every day, no matter what you're producing, uh, he's robbing you. Well, what is it that's enabling him to rob you? It's force. So... Uh, in uh, feudalism and slavery, what you have is uh, not, uh, the inequality is not based on any positive productive contribution. It's based on physical force. It's based on a process of theft. And as a result, it represents other people's equivalent loss. What some people gain from others by means of theft is other people's loss. That's true. Now, those who think that uh, one man's gain is automatically another man's loss, they don't have room in their brains for a concept of gain that doesn't uh, represent theft. They think the only way, at least by implication, they think the only way that uh, anyone can grow rich is by being a thief. Now, whoever is a thief, uh, it's true that to the extent that he gains, others do equivalently lose. But that's not the only way that people gain. Uh, the enemies of capitalism have never gotten beyond uh, the, the world of feudalism. They apparently don't have room in their minds for the concept of positive productive contribution, an expansion in the total of what's produced, some gaining without others losing, some gaining and making it possible for everybody to gain. Uh, they just can't comprehend such a thing. So uh, bear in mind uh, this, the very opposite uh, nature of what's involved. In one case, under uh, fortunes under capitalism, it's positive productive contribution and a general benefit resulting from the positive productive contribution. In the other case, it's not productive contribution of any kind. It's physical force, uh, outright theft. And that means uh, an equivalent loss to others. In fact, more than an equivalent loss, because where you have a society uh, ruled by theft, uh, not only will one man's gain be an equivalent loss to others, but what will be the effect on the total of, of what's produced? If whoever produces knows that if he succeeds in producing, he'll uh, just be robbed. There'll be less produced overall. So uh, 
there you have uh, one man's gain uh, ends up being everybody's loss, uh, ultimately including even his own. Just think about the fact when you have a system based on robbery, like, fe like feudalism, uh, the feudal lords succeed in robbing the serfs, that's true, and they uh, live better than the serfs, but how well do the feudal lords themselves live? If you have a society where it doesn't pay anyone to attempt to produce more than the uh, minimum that he can keep for the next day, what was the standard of living of the feudal aristocrats and the ancient slave owners? Do you think they were driving around in Mercedes? Well, uh, maybe a little bit better than subsistence, but uh, certainly nothing to compare with the standard of living of even the average or significantly below average person in a modern society. They ended up uh, keeping themselves poor. You see, where you have uh, everyone attempting to live by robbery, uh, there's not very much to rob. Now, uh, I make the point that, uh, well, this it's obviously uh, profoundly unjust uh, to lump the feudal aristocrats and the, uh, the ancient slave owners and modern businessmen and capitalists to put them all under the same umbrella and treat them as belonging to the same group. That's a pr an incredible injustice if you think about it. You're saying that uh, someone uh, who's a positive, productive innovator, he's essentially indistinguishable uh, from a massive thief. And that's, that's embodied in the expression robber barons. Uh, who, who is, uh, who is uh, described by the term robber barons? Carnegie. Uh, Carnegie was one. Rockefeller. Rockefeller. Uh, all of the uh, great industrialists of the 19th century. They were all called robber barons. Based upon the perception that they were working off the sweat of the working class. That we well, they could just take the land with them. They, they were able to get the land they wanted to run their road. What is it? They were able to get the land. Now, well, they, they were, there's a sense that the, indig the indigents who were there were being forced off the land at uh, extremely low prices. Uh, no, no. With, well, the, with the use of force. Are you uh, talking about the Indians? No, I'm talking, no, I'm talking about the settlers. <laughs> well, folks. did you think that... Uh, I'm, that's where the perception of robber band came from. What do well, I think? I think no, that's just the way it went. Uh, the, the perception robber baron uh, comes uh, not from anything to do uh, with, with land questions, Indians or, or anyone else. Uh, it comes from, a Marx, from the Marxist economic theory. Uh, as we'll see in the last two weeks of the term, uh, Marx's theory of profit is that a profit is earned on the same foundation as the gain of a slave owner. So you just think for a moment, what is it that enables a slave owner uh, to gain by owning a slave? Is it retrospect that makes this look utterly ridiculous? Pardon me? Or was this available? To, I mean, was this just a, a complete hypothesis on the basis of, of, of Marx? Or uh, well, Marx something evident in, at that point in history that would point to this? Because it, at this point, it just flies in the face of everything you're discussing. Yeah, well, maybe it was not as readily available or as dramatic then, but uh, it was certainly accessible. And uh, what Marx did, I, I mean, it was pretty obvious that things were improving uh, quite substantially through the 19th century. And uh, there are sections uh, in the Communist Manifesto, which was written as early as 1848, acknowledging uh, pretty great accomplishments, like the construction of railroads, uh, telegraphs, uh, things of this kind. Uh, that were uh, in, in more enormous historical feats. Uh, uh, some of Marx's ideas come from uh, uh, misunderstanding classical economics and distorting that. But uh, his basic idea was uh, that uh, the source of gain, uh, whether to a slave owner or to a businessman, is that a worker is able to work more hours in the day than is required to produce his own subsistence. So let's say you have a slave 
uh, he needs to work six hours a day to produce his own necessities. Uh, you have to allow him to do that, otherwise, if you attempt to seize 100% of his product, what <coughs> happens to him? He dies of starvation. So that wouldn't be a very uh, intelligent policy. So if, if the slave owner wants to gain from the slave on a continuing basis, he has to at least allow the slave to keep enough to stay alive and, and strong enough to work. But the theory flies in the face of, like, I mean, not even economic theory. I mean, let's just take basic warfare theory. Any war has been built on innovation. This strips the motivation for that. And, I mean, just subsi if, if your goal is subsistence, yeah. if that's what the doctrine is based upon, it's just basic subsistence. It doesn't incorporate any motivation for ingenuity and innovation. It seems to have many more holes than just economic theory, which is basic survival theory. Well, it depends at what level you're talking. But let's not get off into too much of a digression on, on Marx. Uh, the reason that people were describing uh, the situation as slavery uh, was not because it was slavery, but because they had uh, false ideas in terms of which they were interpreting the facts they saw. Now, uh, the, the, the kind of rationale, we'll, we'll, we'll be getting into uh, a concrete example of the, this kind of uh, confusion and injustice in just a moment. But uh, I do want to point out, I want to be sure to, uh, to make the point that uh, the position of the uh, feudal aristocrats uh, was not based on any economic role that they played. Uh, it was not based on the fact that they were landowners. They were not genuine landowners uh, because they lacked essential rights of landowners, such as being able to sell their property. Uh, I think I pointed out last week the economic theory of feudalism uh, was that property belonged to a bloodline, not to any specific living individual. And if that were true, uh, the property would be as much that of your unborn great-grandchildren as yours, and that would preclude your having any right to sell it. Now, any real property owner has the right to sell his property. The feudal aristocrats lack that. Uh, they also lack the right to uh, put people off their land. If you're a landowner, uh, then uh, if there are people living on your land against your wishes, you have the right to ask them to leave. The, the feudal aristocrats did not have that right. The serfs went with the land. They couldn't leave. That's the better known aspect. But they also could not be dispossessed. And uh, the feudal aristocrats uh, could not compete with one another uh, for labor. It, w it would be an immediate cause of war if the Count of X were attempting to recruit serfs on the uh, uh, properties or on the, on the lands of the Duke of Y. Uh, so uh, you couldn't compete for labor, you couldn't fire workers, uh, you couldn't sell your land. Uh, they lacked these essential powers of owners. And then they possessed powers that don't go with ownership. They possessed uh, powers of uh, so-called low and high justice. Uh, to flog people or to hang them, uh, and that's not a part of uh, owning land. So uh, uh, an accurate appraisal of their position was not that they were landowners, but uh, they were, in effect, uh, the government officials in their area. And they, the foundation of their higher incomes was, uh, in essence, the ability to collect taxes, to lay and collect taxes and, uh, and live off them. Now, uh, this issue of uh, slavery uh, can be illustrated at least in part uh, by quoting uh, John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, I, mean, I, may have, uh, I think I've referred to him earlier in the term in connection with marginal utility. Uh, he's very popular among the, uh, quote, liberals, unquote. Uh, uh, he was a professor for many, many years at Harvard University. And uh, I have a quotation from him uh, right here, which I'd like someone to be kind enough to read. Starting uh, with the worker mm -hmm. in a Calcutta jute mill. The worker in a Calcutta jute mill who loses his job, like his American counterpart during the Great Depression, has no high prospect of ever finding another. He has no savings, nor does he have unemployment insurance. The alternative to his present employment, accordingly, is slow but definite starvation. 
So though nominally a free worker, he is compelled. The fate of a defecting southern slave before the Civil War, or a serf before Alexander II, was not appreciably more painful. The choice between hunger and flogging may well be a matter of taste. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Cunningham. Very well done. Now, notice you're being told there uh, in this passage pretty openly that uh, we thought that uh, people were free workers, and uh, there's a reference uh, to conditions in the North and the South. Uh, what do you think uh, Southern slave owners had to say about this subject in the days before the Civil War? What kind of rationalization would they have used uh, to, uh, to make an excuse for slavery? Well, they, their argument was precisely what Galbraith is saying, that uh, uh, though nominally free, in essence, you're a slave. They were saying that uh, in the northern factories, while you didn't have uh, slavery technically, uh, formally and openly, uh, the actual status of the workers there was no different uh, than that of slaves. Why? Well, why? I'm saying because at the end of the day, you're being provided a way to feed yourself, or you're being fed. Well, it's not because you're being fed. The argument is from Galbraith that uh, your alternative is starvation if you don't work at these miserably low wages. And in his view, uh, it's a, a matter of taste whether you're working to avoid hunger or to avoid a flogging. See, in his view, okay, the southern slave owners, if their slaves don't work, they'll flog them. If the uh, northern factory owners' workers don't work, uh, they'll die of hunger. And to Galbraith's mind, uh, those two are equivalent. Well, let's examine that for a moment and uh, look at this in, in a little more detail. Uh, notice that uh, the issue of having a choice for which employer to work, that's uh, totally disregarded. Uh, Galbraith is simply asserting, uh, here's someone who's unemployed, he has no high hopes of finding another job. Now that can certainly be true uh, for a limited time if you're in the midst of a Great Depression and you might not be able to find another job. But if you look at someone over the course of most of his lifetime, if uh, someone is not a slave, uh, will he have the ability to find a different job than the one he's presently doing. No. Pardon me? You're saying if he is a slave? Or no, if he is not a slave. Oh, if he's not, sure. Yeah. Okay, so now, what difference is there uh, between someone being a slave, as in, uh, in the Old South, and someone living in the North and not being a slave? What is a, a major radical difference? Well, freedom of choice. Freedom of choice. Uh, the free worker can choose to work for that employer, among the employers willing and able to employ him, who offers the best terms. He's in a position to choose the best of what may be available. The slave can't do that. Uh, if the slave is uh, toiling in the cotton fields, and he might be aware there's some other kind of work he's capable of doing or learning uh, that would uh, give him a better standard of living, uh, he can't go. He's chained to his job, or if he's not chained but attempts to leave, uh, there'll be packs of dogs and people with shotguns after him, uh, so uh, he can't leave. Now this is uh, very important in and of itself. Uh, you want to be free even though not there may be particular times when you can't find another job. There are also going to be times when you can, and it'll make a big difference if you have the ability to get to a better job rather than stay with where you are. Now, uh, also, uh, I think it can be shown that uh, those periods in which uh, you can't find an alternative job, uh, the periods of depression, uh, they're the result of violations of freedom at a different level. Uh, they're the result of violations of freedom uh, with respect to uh, the kinds of money and credit system that we have, and also with respect to the height of wage rates. Uh, when you have a financial contraction, as occurs in a depression, uh, what would bring about a restoration of full employment and the availability of as many jobs as there were workers? What do you need to do to enlarge the quantity of something demanded to come up to the level of the supply available? Infused means of, of purchase. 
prices. Lower prices. Lower prices. That will do it. But uh, are there uh, things standing in the way of a fall in prices? In this case, the relevant price would be wage rates. Yes. Uh, there certainly are. Uh, all kinds of government intervention interferes with the uh, fall in wage rates. Uh, in place, they're in place uh, out of concern uh, that they need to combat the exploitation of the employers. But uh, we do have these interferences. And so uh, you'll have people in a position in which they can't find another job, not because there are in fact no jobs out there to be done, but because the law makes it un not worthwhile to offer these jobs, because the law is insisting on a level of wage rates too high uh, to employ everyone able and willing to work. But uh, there's more than that. Uh, let's look at this comparison. Uh, in Galbraith's view, it doesn't matter if you're working to avoid hunger or to avoid flogging. I, uh, let's try to identify the causal connection of a slave owner uh, to the worker's fear of uh, flogging and the causal connection of, uh, of an employer a capitalist employer uh, to the worker's fear of hunger. Who causes the pain of flogging? The slave owner is causing the pain of flogging. Is the capitalist causing the worker to be hungry, or is the capitalist employer in paying the worker wages pre preventing the worker from being hungry? In paying the wages, he's preventing the worker from being hungry. The capitalist employer's contribution is to alleviate the pain of hunger, not to cause it. The pain of hunger is what exists out in nature if you're not producing. The uh, relation of the capitalist employer uh, to the wage earner's hunger is that the capitalist employer enables the wage earner to overcome and avoid the hunger. Now, going further, uh, notice what is required to keep a slave at his job? Force. 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 Whips and chains. What is required to keep a capitalist uh, worker, a wage earner, from his job? Force. You need force to keep him from his job, because precisely because his job is the source of a positive, the wages, uh, the means of overcoming <coughs> hunger, achieving many other things, the worker wants to work, He's there. The worker in a capitalist factory is not chained to his work. He's not kept there by force. If he quits, uh, no one is going to hunt him down with packs of dogs or anything like that. He'll lose his wages. He wants to keep the wages. That's why he's working. He's working not to avoid a negative, not to avoid pain. He's working for a positive to get his wages. This is a radical day and night difference. In the one case, you have to use force to keep someone at the job. In the other case, you'd have to use force to keep someone from the job. And notice that day and night difference is obliterated, it's ignored, and uh, Galbraith is treating the uh, employees as slaves. Now, I'll just uh, uh, make the point which uh, uh, I made earlier, at least in, in the text, uh, concerning inequality under socialism. Uh, the socialist propaganda uh, before socialism became uh, so obviously a failure, uh, the socialist propaganda was that uh, socialism uh, would finally uh, represent the foundation of a new world order, uh, eliminating all of this uh, uh, economic inequality, uh, fighting the common denominator of uh, slavery, feudalism, and capitalism, uh, socialism, it was argued, uh, would be the culmination of the uh, revolutions establishing political democracy. Uh, it would establish economic equality. Uh, in the 19th century, in the 18th century, according to the socialists, uh, we had the American Revolution, the French Revolution. Uh, they established political equality, uh, did away uh, with uh, social classes, uh, the inequality of social classes, uh, but they didn't complete the job. What was needed was uh, the elimination also of economic inequality. Now, uh, socialism never eliminated economic inequality. What it did was uh, reestablish feudal style inequality once again. Uh, under socialism, there was economic inequality. 
And uh, it manifested itself in some uh, fairly gross forms, uh, such as networks of stores uh, whose only uh, legal customers uh, were high party and government officials, uh, from which the ordinary citizens uh, were uh, precluded from entering. And the uh, high party and government officials, uh, they had access to special hospitals and clinics. Uh, their children went to special schools. Uh, they could get limousines. Uh, the masses couldn't even get a car of any kind. Uh, they could, uh, they would have uh, country homes, dacas, villas. Uh, the masses were living uh, multiple families in the same apartment. Uh, so they had uh, this kind of inequality going on. And there was a, a fairly well-known book written about it uh, by a, a man who at one time was the vice president of communist Yugoslavia uh, named Gilas, I think. He ended up uh, in prison for having written the book. And uh, the title of his book was The New Class, uh, the class of uh, the Communist Party and government hierarchy. And uh, most people thought this represented a contradiction of the fundamental principles of communism. Uh, but uh, it really does not, and in fact, uh, flows directly from them. Uh, the communists never said uh, that they would have economic equality immediately. Uh, that was supposed to come uh, under uh, communism in its higher phase, uh, after human nature had changed under, uh, as a result of people living under uh, several generations of socialism. Now, what does it mean if you're waiting for human nature to change? What would it mean if you're waiting for the nature of water and gravity to change so that water, instead of flowing downhill, will flow uphill? And when that happens, then some further things will be done. You'll wait a long time. Okay, well, you'll wait forever. So if you're really talking about human nature, uh, that is not going to change, and any uh, program based on a change, uh, forget it, that is of no significance. But more than that, uh, the uh, basic moral political principles of socialism imply uh, feudalistic type inequality uh, and it follows from the way they view uh, the purpose of the individual. See under capitalism each, each individual is considered to be an end in himself and that's reflected in the principle in our Declaration of Independence uh, the right to the pursuit of happiness. Each individual has the right to the pursuit of his own happiness. Well, he and his happiness, uh, their ends in themselves. How do the socialists perceive the end of the individual? What's his alleged purpose from the perspective of the socialists? For the better of society. Yeah, the, the individual is the means to the ends of society. The individual is the means to the ends of society. Does anyone, is anyone not aware uh, that that's how they view the individual? Uh, can I assume that you agree with this? All right, well, if that's uh, their idea, and that is their idea, uh, there's a problem, and that is that society as such has no real physical existence. There is no, you will not find an entry in a phone book anywhere uh, giving a telephone number for society. It doesn't have a post office box or an email address. You can't get in touch with society as such. You can't say, hey, society, uh, what are your objectives? Uh, what are your purposes that I'm to devote myself to? You can't find that out. There's no society to contact. Well, what exists in practice is there will be a ruling elite whose uh, function it is to divine the will and the purposes and goals of society and then announce them to the masses. And that function is filled uh, by the Central Committee of the Communist Party, or whatever equivalent it might have. Uh, so what it actually means in practice, and means necessarily is, when you say the individual is the means to the ends of society, is that the individual is the means to the ends of society as divined and interpreted by the ruling elite. So the individual is the means to the ends of society as determined uh, by the ruling elite. Now, how far is that from saying the individual is the means to the ends of the ruling elite? 
Well, as soon as you see it that way, then it's clear that socialism represents uh, the reestablishment of a feudal aristocratic uh, order of society. See, what was the, the purpose of the serfs? Uh, to whom were the serfs ends? The aristocrats. The, the serfs were there uh, to do the aristocrats bidding. Well, under socialism, the masses of people are there to do the bidding of the ruling elite. They're the ends to the rulers. And seen in that light, it's perfectly logical that they had special stores and clinics and schools and all, this, the, all of the other things. And then reinforcing that is the total economic powerlessness of the average citizen under socialism. Is there any way that uh, he can compel uh, the rulers to do his bidding? Does it matter how he spends his income? By, uh, by changing his pattern of buying and abstention from buying, is he going to make some things more profitable and other things less profitable, thereby inducing the rulers to change their behavior? No, there is no profit motive. There's nothing that he can do uh, that will uh, make it worthwhile for the rulers to do more of one thing and less of another. But you see, under capitalism, each individual has his own financial means, and if the consumers are spending more for certain things and less for other things, that determines what it's profitable for business firms to produce. Under capitalism, where each man is an end in himself, uh, that also works in the market uh, because the market has to produce uh, for the objectives of the ultimate consumers as manifested in how they spend or choose not to spend their funds. And then, of course, uh, I think we had some good discussion a few weeks ago uh, showing how uh, socialism is violently opposed uh, to every aspect of political democracy, any form of uh, political freedom. Uh, there's no such thing as freedom of press when the government owns all the newspapers, publishing houses. Uh, no freedom of speech when the government owns all the lecture halls, all the radio stations. Uh, no freedom of employment when the government is the sole employer. And uh, we saw further problems, uh, that the economic conditions are utterly miserable. Uh, the regime uh, is the logical target of people's anger and dissatisfaction at the uh, botch that socialism makes of things. And so what's required for uh, the government to stay in power in those conditions? Of course, they need a reign of terror to keep the lid on all possible criticism. So. Uh, in no sense uh, is uh, socialism uh, the uh, continuer of, uh, of the uh, political revolutions of the 18th and 19th century. Okay, any questions, comments, objections? You think I'm unfair to socialism, uh, to the opponents of economic inequality? Uh, should there be a representative of those views here uh, to have equal time? so that then you could have uh, 16 years of education that way, plus half of this course, uh, to achieve balance. <laughs> yeah. How did the, the situation in China, they adapt more of a capitalistic approach to sustain their growing country. Yeah. Um, how, is, you know, how do you see it playing out in terms of the, the communist rulers is there going to be a gradual erosion of what the communist doctrine? Obviously, they're, they're not compatible. So one's going right. to give if, as they control to be an economic power. Right? I would think so, yes. And uh, I don't know how that will end. Uh, it could end that they have a profound change in the kind of government they have. Or uh, it could be that uh, they, they crush uh, their economic development in order to maintain the political system. I think you're right in pointing out uh, that the two are basically incompatible. Now, uh, there's been uh, some uh, limited movement toward a greater freedom, uh, at least in hotels in Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, you can get uh, foreign publications. You could buy the International Herald Tribune, I think, and uh, some Western magazines. I don't know to what extent they're accessible uh, to the general public. Pardon me? In Beijing, they're completely accessible. It's extremely open. They're open to everybody in Beijing. Okay, well, that's good for them. Uh, I know 
uh, uh, perhaps half a dozen copies or so of my book are now in different libraries in China. So uh, I don't know to whom that's accessible, but if it's generally accessible to the masses waiting to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I heard all of them checked out constantly. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, it's not something that they want to pirate. Uh, How thick is your book if it's written in Chinese? I really don't know. <laughs> I don't think it's written in Chinese. Uh, there is no Chinese edition. <laughs> okay. Well, who knows? Maybe uh, they'll, they'll gradually evolve. I don't know. What do you see, and I'm not really just in current events, but what do you see happening Castro's latest move to remove the dollar from, from his system? Oh, uh, he's uh, attempting to punish us, I think, uh, because of uh, sanctions remaining in well, force. This is more punishing. I, I interpret it to be more punishing his people, mm -hmm. more punishing the people who have you know, cousins in Florida who are sending them dollars and then infusing. It seems to be a completely self-defeating principle. Yeah, well, probably more Cubans will end up in concentration camps because they'll probably continue to trade in dollars, and then it's it's criminal activity. Well, they, he taxed it. He taxed the actual um, conversion. It's like a 10 or 14 percent tax to take the dollar back to the I don't know the, the denomination. Yeah, so but there'll be people ignoring the the tax, and they'll be guilty of a crime. And then I don't know how tightly they'll be enforced. But fortunately, he has to die in not too many years. Yeah. Pardon me? He tripped, then he tripped the other day? Yeah, yeah a few days ago. Them. Yeah. It's kind of strange how it's seeing somebody call it up. Yes, Mr. Trenksley. <laughs> what are your thoughts on, on Russia with the, um, the oil company, Nucos, that um, ran into the issues and basically the, the government has taken over? Are you saying, uh, what is the situation in Russia with uh, uh, Putin's government's actions toward the oil company Yukos, and uh, might they be heading back uh, toward uh, an old Stalinist-style uh, regime? Well, I think uh, what uh, precipitates their, their anger against Yukos and their, their treatment of it is that the uh, head of Yukos was the main financier of the political opposition to Putin. And so uh, that's probably what set Putin off against Yukos. Uh, and uh, it seems that there, what, uh, as the uh, state oil company bought out P Yukos or is uh, seizing it, they're seizing it. I mean, well, that bodes very ill uh, for development along market lines. So they, they might end up where they back in, in communism. Who knows? Uh, I, I couldn't predict it. Now, uh, Putin's main economic advisor is still supposed to be someone named Ilya Aronov, uh, who, who is supposedly uh, a serious advocate of capitalism. So I don't know what to make of that. And anything else? So did I agree yeah. correctly with China that it has to go one way or the other, but it can't blend? It has to go... I, I don't think I don't think where they are is stable, and uh, uh, certainly with Hong Kong, uh, either they'll have to uh, bring Hong Kong into their system and take away whatever freedoms remain in Hong Kong, or uh, what's in Hong Kong will tend to spread to the rest of China. It's very hard to have uh, two parts of the same country with radically different political institutions. Well, Hong Kong is the example though. About Hong Kong is that it wasn't, it was always a, a, an open market, but it wasn't free in political terms in the sense of it wasn't a representative democracy mm -hmm. under British control. Yeah, but there was substantial uh, political freedom, though, in Hong Kong uh, in terms of what you could publish, yeah. uh, your freedom to espouse ideas, freedom of employment. And in the last years of uh, Britain's yeah. rule, there was uh, a large measure of local self government.
Okay, well, I'd like to turn now uh, to the beginning of the subject of economic competition, uh, the influence of the division of labor on it. And uh, yet again, uh, there's a, a prevailing view uh, based on uh, ignorance of the division of labor and the difference it makes. And the prevailing view of the nature of competition is that it represents the law of the jungle, uh, the survival of the fittest, uh, dog eat dog, a rat race, and whatever other uh, epithets uh, along those lines people can come up with. Now, uh, let's pause for a moment and uh, try to identify uh, what conditions are like under in the jungle. Uh, what what kind of competition exists in the jungle? Uh, let's uh, consider competition among uh, lions. Uh, what creates this competition among lions for game animals? Survival, hunger. Uh, survival, hunger. Uh, what is it that uh, makes it an issue of survival and hunger and competition? Finite, uh, uh, finite resources. Finite resources. Yeah, there are a limited number of game animals. Uh, nature provides only so many gazelles and zebras and whatever else the, the lions like to eat. And as soon as the population of the lions uh, grows up to a certain point, uh, the supply of zebras, gazelles, etc., is then scarce, and the lions lack any ability to enlarge those populations. Uh, the, the lions uh, just have to take the supply of zebras and gazelles as an unalterable given that they have no power to increase at all. And uh, as soon as their population uh, is such that uh, the number of lions alive uh, would require the existence of more zebras and gazelles than there are, uh, then the lions are in a kind of deadly competition with one another uh, where not all of the lions can survive. And so which lions will survive and which will perish? Strongest. Strong. Uh, in effect, the strongest, uh, taking strongest to mean uh, those who can see the furthest, have the keenest sense of smell, can run the fastest, jump the furthest. Uh, uh, those who are best physically fit, they will survive. The older, weaker lions, they will perish. They'll die of starvation. Now that is uh, truly the law of the jungle and the survival of the fittest. Uh, those terms have literal application uh, to such conditions. And that's uh, uh, their proper field of application. Now let's uh, look at uh, economic competition. Uh, let's look at the competition uh, between uh, uh, IBM and Apple, or uh, General Motors and Toyota. Uh, are these firms uh, in competition with one another in any sense uh, remotely similar uh, to that of the lions uh, in the jungle? Yes. Uh, okay. how far you take well, is it the case that uh, nature has provided a certain number of computers or computer chips and uh, IBM and Apple are in competition to see who can grab the most from the computer trees? No, no, no. no obviously not. Now, what is the nature of their competition? Uh, they're competing for dollars, but what do they have to do in their efforts uh, to obtain more dollars from the buyers. Bring value to the market, create innovation. Innovation, uh, uh, produce better, uh, more economical computers. Notice uh, the nature of economic competition uh, in, in, under capitalism is not at all the grabbing off of a limited supply of nature-given necessities. The, the whole issue of a limited supply of nature-given necessities, that uh, ex exists for the animals. Uh, it does not exist for human beings. Uh, the most fundamental underlying characteristic about human beings that makes things different for us is that we possess the faculty of reason. So uh, unlike the lions or any other uh, species in the jungle, we're able to identify uh, what our survival requirements depend on. Uh, if it comes to something like food, when we look out at cattle, let's say, well, we identify uh, what does the survival of cattle depend on. And so we develop veterinary medicine. Uh, we uh, know uh, what kind of food they require. We provide them with additional food. Uh, we are in a position to enlarge the supply of cattle, to enlarge the supply of anything re we require. And the ultimate uh, characteristic that we possess that makes that possible, which none of the animals possess, 
is that uh, we have the faculty of reason. And because we have the faculty of reason, we do not have to adjust to uh, what nature provides us with. We don't have to take the state of nature as an unalterable given. We're in a position to change nature. We act upon our environment, we improve our environment, we enlarge the supply of things useful to us. And this is what competition centers on. Economic competition is a competition in the positive creation of new and additional wealth. Uh, what uh, IBM and Apple and Dell and whatever, uh, what they're competing about is not grabbing off a limited stock of nature-given necessities. They're competing in terms of who can offer a newer, better computer, uh, a more economical computer. Uh, what the automobile companies are competing about is the same thing. Who can offer a better, more economical product? So the nature of the competition is day and night different. Instead of being a competition in terms of who can grab what from nature, it's a competition in the positive creation of new and additional wealth. And the only thing that's limited, it's not the wealth that's limited, it's the dollars in the hands of the buyers that are limited at any given time. And what you're competing for is getting dollars from the buyers. What do you have to do to get more dollars from the buyers? What is the means of obtain of inducing the buyers to part with more of their dollars going to you? Provide them more of a company to them. Provide them with something better. Provide them with a newer, better product, a more economical product. And this goes hand in glove with the nature of the process being a process of the positive creation of new and additional wealth. So this is a, of the diametric opposite of competition in the animal kingdom. And uh, do you have a last quick question, uh, Mr. Levy? Okay, well then maybe, why not hold it, <laughs> hold it till after we return from the break, okay? So let's pause here and take a, a 25 minute break and then we'll come back.